Melissa, thank you for opening our hearts up to the now. That is so precious. And Rachel, you know, I can listen to her anytime. Follow this woman. She is powerful and she has a lot to say. It's really important. So um, I just wanted to first honor all those people that forgot to set their clocks ahead. <laughs> You know, back in the day when people weren't at service, we would say, well, they're at home worshiping St. Mattress. <laughs> and now we can be really playful with that and be in our jammies and just go to Zoom or Facebook. And so we really celebrate you folks out there and glad you joined us today. Uh, you know, it's a new day and we can get excited about our spirituality in so many different ways. There's so much uh, for us. Um, so uh, if you saw the um, title of the talk is something about a spoonful of sugar is the medicine. Now, uh, our home organization brings us these uh, outlines that are planned a year in advance. And so we really don't know what, what they're going to be and in what context they're going to be. And so there was some consternation about play and humor with what's going on in the world with the Ukraine and all the suffering with Russia and Ukraine and everybody else in Europe. And uh, so that's always the challenge of the minister, you know, is if God is so good, why do people suffer? And linking that with a, a, a message of humor. <laughs> so that becomes, you know, a, a difficulty. And there was consternation among ministers about how are we going to do this? And, you know, the, the reality is we have to support Ukraine and Russia however we can and, and the suffering that's happening there. At the same time, if we are to focus on peace, we have to look deeply at the unpeaceful parts of ourselves because that's really where the solution is. And, as Rachel so eloquently said, play and laughter can really break that up and release it. I remember... Um, in our home, we had uh, Reader's Digest. I don't know if any of you had Reader's Digest in your home. And I was always anxious every month because I would go immediately to this section, I think it was called Laughter is the Best Medicine. And there were a couple of other sections all about jokes and laughter. And I, I don't know why, but I was really drawn to that. I don't care what else was in the Reader's Digest, but I had to check that out because there was something inside of me that knew that lightening up things was really important. So, as I said, it's really difficult to combine humor from the podium. It can be a really tricky thing. So I decided today to just stick to the basics. So I want to tell you the story about how Siddhartha uh, was inspired to become Buddha. So if you don't know, Siddhartha is the name from a book by Herman Hesse called Siddhartha, and it's the story of a Hindu prince that was uh, isolated in his castle, and he could look out and see the rest of the, the town, and he always wondered what's on the other side of the wall, and he was told all, all sorts of stories about how horrible it was and all that. So anyway, he decided to check it out for himself, and what he saw was the squalor and the, the poverty and how terrible it was, and at the same time, he saw joy and laughter and all of those other things that people are about. And so as he uh, went about looking at the slums and looking at all this, he decided to renounce his title and give up all his wealth to just focus on people. And so it was really exhausting to walk amongst the people and see both the sadness and the joy and everything that was happening. And so as he's going along, one day he sees a food stall and they're making food and he's really excited about seeing that and the diversity and variety of all the food that was available. And he was just so overcome that he just wanted to taste it. 
And so he put his order in, and do you know what the order was? Make me one with everything. <laughs> you can laugh. <laughs> and that's what inspired him to become Buddha. <laughs> but it, um, I'll be here all week, folks. <laughs> you know, I, I tried that once in our center in, in Florida. And uh, I said, I'll be here for all week. And one of our practitioners stood up and said, well, we won't. <laughs> but you know, that Jack was a practitioner. He was a great practitioner. He was a Vietnam veteran, uh, Air Force veteran. And uh, he just passed last year. And so I just want to honor him. Who's that? I'll be here all week. So I like to think that Jesus was actually a stand-up comedian. In the, like um, George Carlin or Lenny Bruce, you know, anti-establishment. And so he pissed off the Romans, the Pharisees, the Jews, the rabbis, frequent targets. Even Peter, he said, you know, uh, you, if you wake Peter up in the morning, he won't even remember your name. <laughs> but I don't. Oh boy. <laughs> so so um, Jesus was a stand-up comedian and he was crucified for it. And they're still crucifying comedians today for their humor. You know, that just the nature of comedy that it's kind of like golf. Every shot makes somebody happy and somebody mad. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's a tricky thing. So um, Rachel already said something really good about how laughter impacts our bodies. And I just wanted to add this. According to the Neuro Leadership Institute, laughing swaps the cortisol, which is the stress chemical. It swaps the cortisol in our bloodstream with highly sought after chemicals in the brain, dopamine, oxytocin, and endorphins. Dopamine in particular enhances learning, motivation, and attention. In other words, it helps us embody the changes in thinking and behavior that we are seeking to make permanent in our lives. So whether you're doing stand-up or laughter yoga or stand-up comedy or you like to laugh and have friends with you and you know it is all a healthy thing that helps us break through that energy that is constricting us. And it's amazing how the bodies automatically respond to that. I think there's really something important to that. Uh, you know, you, you look at what these bodies are capable of, how they crawl through every nook and cranny on this planet, exploring, finding ways to find pleasure and joy. And, you know, it's a natural thing when you consider this garden that has been laid out for us. I mean, it's really amazing. We, have, we tap into our imagination and intuition to be inspired about what, what makes us happy, and our brain determines all the possible ways that that can happen, how to create stuff from all of this abundance. And it can be a challenge when the way that I think we should explore uh, our abundance is the way I think everyone should. That's where we all get into trouble. So given this unique gift in this entire galaxy, this very special place that we've been given, the planet itself is a living organism with all of its resources, the abundant life, science, and the arts. Shouldn't we all be having a better time? Yeah, yeah. And so we make choices about that. Ralph Waldo Emerson said this, the infinite alone has wrought and suffered. The, in, the, the finite alone has wrought and suffered. The infinite lies stretched in smiling repose. I think there's something really important to, to see there. The infinite lies stretched in smile, smiling repose. We're the ones that are creating all this turmoil, not the universe. So for all we know, all of our ancestors are up there laughing 
at all of our exploits, you know, laughing at all this stuff that's happening. And they're laughing so hard that they're crying. And that crying are the tears that give us hope and promise. And that's what's important to understand about laughter, is embedded in that, is that push toward hope and promise. That's what we're here to do, is lighten up. So we have to find a way to do that in order to be enlightened. And I think Emerson nailed it with the smiling universe. And you know, even the Buddhists have smiling depictions of Buddha, right? And that really fills my heart when I see a smiling Buddha. The uh, depictions of a smiling Jesus, not so much. <laughs> so now I have the Buddhists going after me, the Christians going after me. <laughs> The comedian's going after me. And I guess what that means to me is that we have an untapped capacity that we aren't really even familiar with. Uh, William Blake, the 18th century mystic, said that, how do you know but that every bird that goes the airy way is an immense world of delight closed to your senses five? I just love that. How do you know? but that every bird that goes the airy way is an immense world of delight that we don't even know about, that we can't even experience. So what is that delight that we can tap into? I think part of it is uh, intuition, inspiration, trust, faith. Those are all things that are beyond our senses, really. And all of those things nurture not just our bodies, but our imagination as well. And that release into our imagination can create things that we're not even aware of, but that we desperately yearn for. That yearning for something greater to happen in our lives. We're told in the Bible to be like little children, right? And in Matthew 18, it says this, truly, Unless you change and be like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. Unless you change and be like little children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And here's what Ernest Holmes had to say. The laughter of a child is as important to the universe as the creation of a planet. This is how Important this stuff is. So if we're not doing that, being like little children, what the hell are we doing? Right? Our minds come up with all this rationale about how we're supposed to live, and it's much simpler than that. It is. And we can come up with all the, the reasons why we can't be like little children. And they're good reasons. I mean, that's why we're here. We've, you know, we got to make things happen. And yet, the things that can happen are much greater than that if we tap into our imagination like kids do. So um, I'm going to tell a story about my wife. <laughs> so we used to, we were co-pastors. So we'd get ready for church you know, every Sunday. And on the way to church, she would insist that we do treatment. And I tell you, sometimes that was just really irritating. <laughs> because I would be enmeshed in my not enoughness. Are there going to be enough people there today? Is my talk going to be well received? Um, all of this stuff about not enough. Are we going to, you know, is the collection going to be enough to pay the bills? So you're all familiar with that. And so I would, you know, reluctantly say, OK, well, let's treat for um, a full house today. And so we treat for a full house. And the next week, she would insist again, let's do treatment um, you know, while we're driving on the way to the center. So I make a big sigh and say, OK. Today I want my talk to be well received. And we do treatment. So after a while, you know, I knew what was coming. And even though I still had some exasperation about having to come up with something, you know, I would say, well, it's your turn. She said, no, you have to come up. I finally said, I want happy people. 
And from that moment, each week, all we did is treat for happy people. And that's when my ministry, our ministry, really took off. Because we just focused on that. And we didn't really change anything, we just changed the treatment. And that's how it works, is to lighten up in order to become enlightened. It's a simple concept, really. Ernest Holmes, um, whether he actually said it or not, I can't give you where it's from, but he said, change your thinking, change your life. You know, and we all know that. It's interesting that Fenwick was focused, his older brother was focused on feelings. And I wish we had adapted that, uh, change your feelings, change your life. And I, it's probably change your thinking and feeling and change your life. But there's something there that we have to get our hurt into the change in order to change our lives. And that can often be done through laughter, through play, through humor. Abraham says, you need to find a way to feel better. You know, the, the changing your feeling is a movement of emotion. Changing your thinking is a movement of mind. Whatever we do, we gotta move toward a place of feeling better. That's the real challenge, because we can get just stuck in a place that it, it's called a vicious cycle. In corporations, we talk about vicious cycles and virtual cycles. And the challenge for a corporation is to build a, a, a virtual cycle so that people can be empowered, etc. So I want to tell another story about Kath, my wife, and my mom. So as many of you know, my mom made her transition uh, January 29th. And before that, all of the siblings, we were stuck in this place of, um, you know, hoping that she made her transition and at the same time not wanting to let her go. And she was just, you know, hanging on, hanging on, hanging on. And so we didn't know what to do. So Reverend Kath, as she is wont to do, was studying Emma Curtis Hopkins, the teacher of teachers. And in her reading saw that Emma said, picture the person that is to be healed as being happy. And so Kath suggested to the siblings to gather as many pictures as they could of mom being happy. And we had hundreds of them. And you know, that's the nice thing about technology now is she could post them on the Google picture thing and we could all share those pictures. And of course it brought up all these emotions, seeing her, you know, uh, being happy and playful with all of her family, brothers and sisters, in and at all ages of her life. From when she was 12 years old, we had a picture of her with all of her family. And, you know, it just broke something loose in all of us. And two days later, she died. So it helped her as well, is unbundling all this congested energy that was there. And I gotta say something though, you know, how did Kath know to do that? It's a, um, I call it a spooky entanglement, you know, a quantum entanglement. And what I find is, she shares that with my sister, is this entanglement that can't be explained. And I think it's something about sisterhood. Something that women tap into that men know nothing about. <laughs> Seriously. So we say that, you know, the energy gets stuck and to change our feelings unsticks the energy. I like talking about it in terms of energy because it, to me that's what it feels like. Emotion, energy, whatever it is, we've got to keep it moving. And changing our feelings changes our life because the kingdom of God is at hand. What that means is it's not in the sweet beyond. It's at hand. It's right here in front of us. The resources of the entire universe are right here in front of us. The kingdom of God is at hand. And it says in the Bible, seek ye first the kingdom and what? All else is added. 
So seek first the kingdom, be like little children, and all else is added. That means be playful, be happy, find a way to move that energy that's constricted into something that just puts a smile on your face. It breaks up the contemplation of whatever condition we're in, right? Because it's easy to just stay in that place of contemplating all of the conditions and situations, especially now with everything going on in the world. How easy is it to get sucked into the contemplation of conditions? All we need to do is pick up our phone and it's right there available for us, right? And so how can we diminish that? Well, stop picking up your phone every five minutes. You know, how many family meetings have you been in where, you know, we're focused on that. We've got to break out of the contemplation of conditions, break up that toxic thought patterns that just make it impossible to look at your neighbor, at your friend, without all of that stuff being in the way. It's so hard to have a, uh, an exchange of energy without that getting in the way. And that's what we're here to do, is exchange that energy. Now here's the thing, we want to be able to go out and play with each other and experience, you know, go out to breakfast, lunch, dinner, whatever, share uh, going to plays and all of those things that bring us together as community, it's really important. And at the same time to recognize that when you do that and you're breaking these toxic thoughts because that's what's happening. You know, you're moving your energy. There's also some residual energy left that very often can look like not enoughness. Oh, I'm not as happy as you appear to be. I wish I could be like that. I wish that my significant other would come to the center on Sunday because they're missing out on what is happening here. Does that make sense? There's energy there that needs to be looked at deeply, which means that we all have to develop a skill to be able to hold that energy for whoever we're with, to make a safe place where they can feel vulnerable, that they feel that it's a trusted space, that they are treated with respect in terms of what they're saying is valid. Because it's so easy to do a spiritual bypass. You know, you see that a lot at funerals where people will say, well, they're in a much better place. Well, you have no idea where they are. And it's insulting to the person for you to assume that you know where they are and they're, they're in a better place. But we do this all the time because we want to be kind. We want to, we're conflict adverse. We don't want to you know, challenge people. You know what, folks, that's what we're here to do. Because all of that stuff that we're all holding in is fertilizer for making a sacred community. It grows trust, it grows connection. That's really the only reason why we're together. And that's what, it, it, it builds, um, a place where an organism can grow naturally. And so an organi organism needs fertile soil to do that. And that's what we all are here, is we're building the fertile soil so people can come in here and feel safe and say, I want what you got. I want what's happening. I don't know what's happening here. I don't understand it. And you can say, I don't either. I was a mess when I came here. But let me tell you how my life has changed. Don't talk to them about the science of mind. Talk to them about how your heart has opened and expanded and you feel uh, that you're experiencing a greater life than you ever have before. Because that's the message that they'll hear. And that's the message that we want them to hear. So all of these things are values that we focus on, that I've been talking about. 
in this community, the, the values, of, some of them are safety, trust, um, inclusivity, <coughs> compassion, gratitude, and extraordinary respect. Where differences of opinion can be honored and where we're not afraid of conflict because that's what brings us to a greater evolution. So our job is to hold this sacred space in the midst of all the horrors and suffering of the Ukraine and Russia and Europe and everything else that's going on in the world. Our job is right here, right now, in this place. As we let go of the unpeaceful parts of ourselves and come together as community, that's what makes a difference in the world. When we learn how to express those values right here and right now, that's what creates a world that works for everyone, where no child goes hungry, where, where no one feels unloved, where prosperity and peace prevail for all living things on the planet. It's an inspiring vision because you are inspiring, and so am I. So it is. Thank you.